Hello, my name is Kevin Gibbons. I'm the Executive Director of UBMD Physicians Group and the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here in Buffalo, New York. I've given a number of presentations over the last three months regarding the status of COVID-19 in our community. I'd like to give you an update now at the beginning of February of 2021 on the subject particularly of vaccines and vaccinations because it's going to be a time when individuals have to make decisions about whether or not to get vaccinated as this becomes available in our community. I'd like to screen share with you now. And so this is the how and why of vaccines. But first, a, a, an update on the status, our current state. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, the illness that emerged at the end of 2019. We barely got through 2020, it's now 2021. The virus and its disease is widespread through the community and the country. The incidence is decreasing slightly in the last few weeks. That's a very good sign. Um, it occurs after the deadliest December and January, the deadliest months the United States has ever had. We know a lot about this virus. It's highly contagious via close contact through the air we breathe. The big problem here is pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread. Pre-symptomatic, those are people who are gonna get sick, but before they get symptoms and know they're sick, they're shedding virus and infecting others. An asymptomatic spread, which typically occurs in younger individuals where throughout their entire infection, they have no symptoms, but are still contagious and shedding virus the entire time. There are new variants, they're in the news. I will spend some time talking about them today. The mortality rates are better than they were in the spring, but they're still significant. The hospitalization needs are a real problem. 10% of patients with symptomatic COVID disease require hospitalization. We had a situation in this country where hospitals in the Southwest part of the country were overwhelmed a few weeks ago, and we're in very close to running out of oxygen and absolutely necessary uh, treatment for these patients. Long haul effects, those are symptoms that last long beyond the disease. That's a real problem. I'm not gonna mention anything further about that today. When I'm in the hospital or the clinic, I get three questions about vaccines repeatedly. First, why aren't vaccines widely available yet? Well, you know, under 30 million have been given out. There have been problems with distribution. More vaccine will be coming of the two vaccines we have available. And there are three other vaccines that will likely be approved in the next few months. So I expect in the coming months, this will not be the limiting step. Do the new variants alter disease spread and mortality? And the answer to that is yes. And that's actually an argument for getting vaccinated sooner than later. Do these variants potentially decrease vaccine effectiveness? The answer to that is also yes. Although the early results are that the vaccine remains effective at preventing death, including patients with the new variants. And finally, people say they have concerns. The, the vaccines came awful quickly. Should they get vaccinated when it's their turn? I'd like to take this opportunity to give you the facts and make the argument about why that's a very important uh, decision with the yes being the answer. And also that is the one thing that really is in our direct circle of control. So vaccine hesitancy, that's what we're talking about. There's a great paper looking at adults in the US surveyed every two weeks about whether or not they'd get a vaccine. As early December, only 56% said they would get a vaccine if it was made available to them. It's broken down by sex, race, degree of education, and age. And the key thing is all of these numbers have to be higher. We have to get more people vaccinated when we have the vaccine available. Particularly our black citizens, uh, the African-American community has been devastated by this virus since the beginning. There is a degree of historical mistrust that is, is, is true um, and has a basis in fact. Uh, we need to do everything possible um, to improve the confidence of all of our citizens to get this vaccine. So this is really the why of this particular, uh, these particular vaccines for this virus. I'm a neurosurgeon. Um, we neurosurgeons fix things. We fix people one at a time. Um, we take care of broken necks and blood clots, ruptured aneurysms, big tumors. But to be honest, uh, what I do and my 4,000 neurosurgical colleagues in this country do really doesn't make a huge dent in terms of life expectancy. Life expectancy in the United States has gone from just under 40 years to just under 80 years um, in the last two centuries. Um, and it's done, for three, done so for three big reasons. Public health measures that bring us clean water. Those are municipal water supplies and effective sewer systems. Modern medicine with obstetrical care that greatly improves maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates. The introduction of antibiotics, that's a story that's less than 100 years old 
but most importantly, really our vaccines. This is a, a, a tombstone from the late 1890s listing 12 children in a single family who died ages one to 19, none reaching really adulthood. Um, we don't see that anymore. And the reason for that is widespread childhood vaccination. There are four types of vaccines, typically um, dead or inactivated virus, live attenuated virus. It, it presents an immune response, but doesn't give disease. Uh, toxins that are manipulated in, into forming toxoids, which don't cause illness, but give you an immune response. And then finally, the ability to use recombinant technology to deny, to, to, to build vaccines, uh, taking a piece of mRNA, which codes for the S spike protein and putting it in a little fat globule uh, and generating an immune response. So there are value calculations with these vaccines. Is there a benefit? Does it prevent the disease you're trying to prevent? Is it safe? What's the risk profile? And how does that benefit and risk of the vaccine compared to the natural history of the disease if you don't get vaccinated? So this is a slide from Tim Murphy uh, from UB from early December, and it reviewed the many clinical trials going on. Here are the mRNA vaccines in the middle. These are the two that are widely available in the United States, not wide enough yet. There are three other vaccines that we anticipate being approved in the next few months. Um, so, so the vaccine picture will be improving. When we talk about vaccine efficacy, that's how it worked in the trial. Did it prevent the disease you were hoping to prevent? Um, effectiveness is how it works in everyday practice. Uh, tetanus vaccine is incredibly effective, essentially 100%. The flu vaccine is only 40 to 60% effective, but that's still enough to prevent thousands and thousands of deaths every year. Every year. When you look at these vaccines for COVID-19 um, with effectiveness 95%, 66%, um, those are great numbers. That's really a home run. And even more important is that each of these vaccines was demonstrated to reduce or eliminate severe COVID-19 disease and eliminate, prevent deaths in these vaccinated patients. That's a huge win. The Novavax vaccine is very interesting because part of the patients that received that vaccine were patients who were suffering from the new variants. And it proved to be highly effective just under 90% in the UK variant and moderately effective, um, about 67% in the South African variant. Those are still good numbers. So these new strains really emerged um, and became a problem in December of 20. They were identified actually earlier in the year. Um, this graph shows things very well. The upper two lines, the orange and yellow, that's the new cases in Britain and in other European countries from September to January, the two blue lines are South Africa versus nearby African countries, again, from September to January. Clearly, in December, the incidence of disease shot up, and that's because of this new strain, um, which is clearly more contagious than the previous strain um, seen in England. This is a slide uh, put out uh, by um, the NHS, or public health uh, system, in England. Um, what's happened in England often happens in the US a month or two later. So there's information to be gained here. Um, these lines represent new cases by age group. The horizontal axis at the bottom is by week of the year. That's a little confusing. The purple line you see here, um, that is at the beginning of September <clears throat> when they started to have their fall spike. Remember here in Buffalo, our fall spike occurred in November, the first and second week in November. The yellow spike, which is the first week of November in England, is when they locked down. You then saw cases decrease. And then after the first week of December, you see cases shoot up in almost every age group for the month of December. The last um, week, it looks like it's gone down. That's the red spike at the top. Why it's gone down, we don't know. Um, but this is a, a pretty impressive graph demonstrating the problem of this new variant. Vaccine safety is very important. It's important to note that between the 74,000 patients who are in the trial and the 20 some odd million who have gotten the vaccine since, there's been no vaccine related deaths and the CDC is following this carefully. There are side effects. I had a sore arm for four hours, that's mild. Moderate side effects, fever and ache, it occurs typically the day after the shot in patients after the second dose. But then there's a thing called anaphylaxis. That's a severe reaction. It's what you see when someone who's allergic to bee venom gets stung by a bee. They need an EpiPen because their face will swell up and they could potentially lose their airway. There's a great study out looking at just under 2 million people who received the Pfizer vaccine. 
21 cases of anaphylaxis, that's 11 cases per million, one in every 90,000, no deaths, four people temporarily, briefly hospitalized, 17 out of 21 had previous history of allergy or anaphylaxis, 15 out of 21 had their reactions within 15 minutes of injection. <clears throat> so what is the risk of this disease, the, the mortality rate, the, the, the case fatality rate? Well, it's lower in the fall than it was in the spring, but when you really crunch the numbers, it's between a half a percent and 1.6%. And this has also been validated recently with information from Britain, the mortality rate before and after the new UK variant emerged. And this is a report looking at a demographic age group close to my heart, men aged 60 to 69 with symptomatic COVID-19. The risk of dying, 10 out of 1,000 or 1% with the old virus, if you will, and now 14 out of 1,000 or 1.4% with the new virus or the new variant. That's a, that's a scary number and that's a very real number um, just released in the last uh, few weeks. So when you crunch the number, the vaccine works, it prevents death. Is it safe? The only serious side effect is anaphylaxis. And it should be noted, when it comes to vaccines, side effects are usually apparent in the first two to three weeks. It is very rare to identify a problem after a month. Um, and we had 20 million some odd people who've already received their vaccines. Anaphylaxis can be anticipated based on history and 100% respond to treatment. So when you really crunch the numbers, this is an effective vaccine, it's a safe vaccine. And when you compare it to the natural history of COVID-19 with a 1% death rate, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great number. That's a great comparison to go by. Um, we sort of have three choices. We can remain in a very restricted near lockdown situation wearing masks, and this will go on for a few years. Um, if we let this disease roll through our community, we, we isolate the nursing homes, but we still let it roll through our adult um, populations, you know, 1% of people are gonna die. That's a, that's a, that's a big number. Um, or we can get vaccinated. I think the argument is strongly that we all need to get vaccinated as soon as we can. Um, I've mentioned previously vaccine development. It used to be a series of steps, one after another with delays between every step that would take 10 to 12 years. What happened last year is these steps were condensed Multiple steps occurred at the same time, particularly the gearing up of engineering and production, um, but no steps were cut, no corners were cut in terms of safety. And all the decisions were done by independent analysis. So people can have confidence in this vaccine. So I understand virus fatigue. Um, 2020 was a horrible year. We had economic hardship, social hardship, educational hardship. Society is going to take years to recover from 2020. But we have a way out, and that way out really is through vaccination. So if you're over 50, you should get vaccinated for yourself. If you're under 50, you should get vaccinated for yourself, but even most, more so for your family, your community, and your country. I'd like to thank you very much, and stay safe.